Again, welcome to uh, to our panel on uh, logistics enabled or uh, technology uh, enabled logistics and sustainment. I think this is a, uh, a critically important topic. You've heard it throughout uh, yesterday, some of the challenges we have with logistics, uh, sustainment, contested logistics, uh, uh, supply chain, manufacturing. There's a common theme going on here uh, where our challenges are as we look at this new uh, uh, um, national security environment uh, that we need to think through. And then as we integrate logistics into that or uh, technology into that equation to uh, be more responsive, more resilient in our logistics uh, infrastructure. So I think the panel today is rather interesting. We have an eclectic view of papers, all of them. While if you look at them individually, you sort of link them, you, look at those and say, how does that uh, apply to uh, technology, logistics, and sustainment? When I would argue that logistics is sort of the whole life cycle, right? If, if uh, what was that, what was the uh, um, professionals or uh, amateurs talk strategy, professionals talk logistics, uh, which is true. Uh, you really need to know this. In a world of uh, advancing, uh, uh, technology, networks, artificial intelligence. Uh, I think things are moving out a lot faster than uh, it has certainly in the in the past. So, um, you know, technology enabled logistics planning typically begins with the development of comprehensive logistics strategy. And if you've had any of my courses or if you were in any of my programs, I would tell you, if you everybody who's a logistician, raise your hand. You're an engineer also, right? Because the the sustainment part of what we des of what we sustain in the future is based upon the design. So I would expect my logisticians to help me stay informed on how this engineering design is the appropriate design, not only to perform the operations that we're intending to do with it to meet the requirement, but how we're going to sustain it. How are we going to maintain and ensure reliability? We could have the most exquisite engineering design and, and break the bank when it comes to the cost and the uh, availability of that system. So as a logistician, I'm looking at them not only how are we going to maintain this, get it to the field, keep the pipelines open, but is that the right design? And we may trade off. You heard that some at the panel this morning. Are we going to go for perfection or are we going to do what's good enough for now or let's incrementally get to that point. So logistics is a critical component across the entire life cycle. As we start coming up with those ideas in the requirements process, we think, how am I going to sustain this? What are the tools of that system? And not only that, the process within that, what's the technology that allows us to do that, develop that logistics piece? And I think our, all of our papers are going to address some of that from the contracting, from the AI solution, how do you sustain the AI that's going to be used to sustain this, this thing that we're keeping, right? Uh, and of course, it, uh, we'll, we'll cap it off with the, the value of operations and uh, reliability. Um, some of the challenges, of course, as we look at technology in the uh, sustainment world are the typical things you hear, right? How do you secure it? We have probably have a whole program around just the piece of equipment or technology you're going to use to help develop the technology. Uh, what's the cost of that? Is it worth it? You know, should I be doing an AI solution to build coffee cups to, for sustainment? Uh, and how complex is it? Uh, what, are the, what are the relationships? Complexity not in just design, but complexity in relationships of contracts, of of between interdependency of programs. Uh, some advantages, certainly once you get it in place, we can be more efficient. Uh, you heard again this morning that one of our biggest challenges is human capital, right? You know, maintaining the education, the training, the, uh, the, the skill sets necessary to have a stable, uniform, and growing uh, human capital base that can do all of that. So, uh, some of this uh, can be mitigated through technology. Um, automation, of course, that sort of speaks for itself. If I can get a machine to do something 50,000 times, do it faster, maybe that is, that's a good solution or, or not. Uh, 
what are disadvantages of that is we look at these technologies, right? AI, what, how do we, we contract for technology and how do we balance between uh, that and the operational world? Uh, how do I determine reliability of the systems that are designed to sustain, develop, maintain, all that? That's part of the equation as well. Compatibility in, uh, with other systems and, of course, uh, how do I reduce human error in this process? Okay, that, that, uh, that's uh, part of the challenge as well. So with that, what I'd like to do is we're, go we're going to... Uh, uh, start with, let's see if I got my iPad set up right here. Yeah. Oh, last one's always right. We'll start with the, uh, the discussion of um, our first paper is acquiring and maintaining AI enabled systems. You know, and the paper is brought by our two authors. We're starting at that end, right? Um, I'm just going to read you their bio and they'll, so that I don't get it wrong. So Major uh, Crookshank is functional area uh, 49. What that means for non-Army folks, it's uh, Operations Research Systems Analysis Officer for the U.S. Army. He's currently a senior research analyst at the Army Cyber Institute. He's, his, he has previous assignments with the Army's Artificial Intelligence Integration Center. Uh, the 780th Military Intelligence Brigade, and several other uh, operational assignments. He holds a PhD in societal computing from Carnegie Mellon University. I'd love to hear more about that, societal computing. That's interesting in and of itself. Uh, has obtained a, a national, from the, uh, which is obtained as a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellow. Uh, as an MS in operations research from the University of Edinburgh, uh, which was uh, obtained as a Rotary Ambassador Scholar. Uh, Major Shane Coates, did I pronounce that right? Coates? Sorry. Uh, is a functional at 51, that's acquisition uh, for within the Army. Uh, he's currently a cyber research manager at the Army Cyber Institute, has previous assignments with the Missile Defense Agency, Army Program Executive Office, Intelligence, electronic warfare, uh, had several military operational assignments. Uh, he's a member of the Army Acquisition Corps and holds DAWIA Advanced Certification in Program Management, uh, which is required if you're going to be a program manager. That's one of the required things that you have to have. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to you and tell us about AI. In the All right. Thank standards. you, sir. Uh, yeah, my name is Major Shane Coates, as Colonel Jones mentioned, and uh, this is Major Krushank. Uh, so I'm providing the programmatic lens. Uh, Ian, he is the technical expert on uh, AI machine learning. Uh, so we teamed up on this paper uh, to see, you know, going into the research question, what are the systemic considerations for Department of Defense uh, AI-enabled AI systems? Uh, the reason why we're coming up with that, uh, Primarily because uh, FY23, uh, DOD invested about $1.1 billion in R&D projects for AI machine learning. Uh, so we're getting ahead of the curve of trying to mature that technology, but you know, what does it look like 10 to 15 years down the road when we're trying to sustain it? And so the research issue that uh, we, we noticed was, you know, DOD instructions and guidebooks currently lack AI considerations. Kind of understandable because it's uh, emerging technology. And uh, this kind of sets the stage or the context for why it's important for acquisitions to understand what it looks like to sustain these systems. Uh, on the left, a lot of you may have seen this before, operation and support costs for total life cycle of an uh, acquisition program or record, or, you know, that's about 72% 72, 72 of the total life cycle cost. Uh, so that sets the stage for why it's important, because the planning occurs early, decision occur early for product support strategies, life cycle uh, sustainment plans early in the acquisition life cycle. And uh, on the right, where we're kind of currently at is requirements are being set for these AI-enabled systems. And as a result, you know, we're already at 85% uh, understood of the operation sustainment costs. So we're, we're right here where requirements are being set, but nothing's been developed uh, in a program of record, and we're still trying to flush out what the actual systemic costs are. However, we already know that 85% of them are already determined 
and we're well left of the uh, acquisition life cycle in the early part of it, but hey, we're just getting started in understanding this problem set, but 85% of our ONS costs are already determined. So that kind of sets the context of why it's important. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Ian to get into more of the uh, AI sustainment details. Thank you. Okay, so if you're gonna leave anything from this talk today, leave it with this. ML models as part of your AI-enabled systems have to be maintained, full stop. Why do they have to be maintained? So let's look at that first part with this. So I just have a little brief example here using an object detection piece. So I think uh, we had some folks talking yesterday about using YOLO for these types of things, right? So here I trained it very quickly on identifying some military vehicles, right? And you can see on the left side, it does fine with a certain type of image, but if I change the background of those vehicles, all of a sudden it shoots way up on false positives and missing things, right? So these AI, these ML models that make up an AI-enabled system, so you, We'll use the, the kind of the Carnegie Mellon framework of an AI stack, and for those who aren't familiar with that term, you'll see this a lot in software engineering, they call something a stack. It's all the components you need to make the thing. Is these machine learning models that are critical to this AI stack, they're the brain of any AI-enabled system, have to be maintained. Everything from changing the data that you use, so data drift in these can, uh, can cause the uh, system to misbehave in unforeseen ways. Um, there are new advances in machine learning algorithms all the time that can get better performance that you now have to upgrade or otherwise change that piece of that. But even down at the lower levels, right, this device or computing layer, something as simple as changing out the camera you're using to collect your images from or the altitude that the sensor platform is flying on is going to change the performance of that ML model. So. Part of this we did is sort of our background in looking at this as well, okay, so we know that these things do have to be maintained. How does this kind of work in practice, right? And so what you'll see it referred to often in industry is this concept called MLOps. And it grows out of the software um, paradigm of thinking about software development as DevOps. And so much like DevOps, the idea here is that you want to take your ML model development and you want it as close to the actual operation of that model, so when it's put what they called put into production when it's now doing inference on live data as possible. You want those components of the design and then the operation that comes with things like monitoring and now maintenance of it to be close together with that. The reason being is as it's in production, as it's processing that live data, inevitably things come up. And if you have the ability to do the model development parts of this, very close to when those things come up, that keeps your ML model working in production much longer and much better. So as we went, we kind of, you know, a fair amount of practical experience, I think, on, on both our sides of dealing with these types of this, but then also the um, MLOps paradigm that's growing about how do we put ML models in real world use here, a couple of big things came up. So I'll talk first about some of these technical considerations when it comes to maintaining AI-enabled systems. The first is there are really like three big things that have to be part of any maintenance plan or doing any kind of maintenance of the machine learning model. So I'll start actually with one at the bottom of here, but you, you have to come up with what are the procedures to do that. So how is the model to be maintained? So if you're using an active learning paradigm, so how many labeled examples do I need from a user before then I say, all right, go back to a retraining procedure. For those of you who like using chat GPT, right, you have some vector database on the back end of this thing, but then it also has what's known as reinforcement learning with human feedback. So that's another paradigm or another method by which you can update these things. Second thing you need with that is you need to know when the thing isn't working, right? So you have to have some kind of test and evaluation scheme that has the appropriate measures that says it's off baseline, we need to perform maintenance on it, or it's still working or the data environment is the same as it was when we trained it, or it's shifted and we now have out of distribution data that now forces you to have to retrain the model. And then the last part is, is there has to be like, somebody has to actually execute the model retraining itself. And so with those kind of necessary components, what we see as sort of existing today, and so this would be at programs like, so I'll, you know, there's Maven, which is now taken over by NGA, but some of the other ones I think we've dealt with over time have been things in the predictive maintenance scheme, um, automated threat recognition types of projects. But there's sort of kind of two ends of the spectrum here with this. On the one end of the spectrum, you have these basically contractor-only approaches to maintaining these, these models, right? 
And so what that can look like is anytime the model goes off spec, you have to send out a field support representative who then can train the thing or do whatever necessary actions it is to get it back working again. Another one, and so again, I'll refer this back to OpenAI, right? This is kind of how their model works. They have the model as a service paradigm. So if you're going to interact with ChatGPT or any of the other GPT models OpenAI has, you actually don't deal at all with how the models were trained, how they're running on the servers, how the uh, data is fed into this. All you have is an API, and you just send your data back over the net, and then it gives you a response back. So all of the maintenance aspects are frankly abstracted away in that case. However, you have to have connectivity constantly to be able to use it, and then there's a certain fee associated with each time you use it. So when we think about the operating paradigm we're going to be in in the near future, we often think about it's going to be in these communications degraded environments. So is it realistic to expect you to be able to ping an API halfway across the world when there is communication denied or degraded? And then combined with that, um, as someone who does often use OpenAI models for various experimentation things, you can rack up costs pretty quick when you're doing a lot of hits to that API. I've gotten in trouble for doing that before. Um, and then on the other end, so that's one side of the spectrum, and then on the other end of the spectrum is, well, we'll do everything in-house, right? So you're going to have someone like me, some Morse or something, whose job it is to design the model, come up with what are the right monitoring metrics for it, train it, put the thing into you know, production, which includes setting up the, the production harness for this, as well as um, productionizing the model code itself and uh, containerizing it. And to be honest, we just don't, it, I mean, I'll speak for the Army, but I sense talking to colleagues across the joint spectrum, this is the same in their services as well. We just don't have a lot of depth. There's just not a lot of folks who can do, especially the complex parts of that, like figuring out what the right metrics are to monitor, right? Building the, the appropriate test harness that can hold the model itself. Doing training, especially if it's a very large, like multi-billion parameter model, is kind of like a difficult thing to do. And so with that, we also had some program considerations. Yeah, thanks, Ian. So when we were looking at this, uh, you know, how is this different than your typical software hardware uh, system? Uh, that's one thing we're trying to get across uh, to y'all is it's going to be a lot different. Typically with hardware software systems, you know, you plan for maintenance quarterly, uh, annually. And uh, same for software releases, you know, every six months, every 12 months for the new updated release for field fixes or any uh, technology insertion. However, with these type of AI-enabled systems, they have more touch time. So the frequency that uh, a soldier would go out there and actually update, retrain the model is could potentially be daily, depending on the changing operating environment. So that is a lot more touch time than you would typically have with your traditional hardware and software systems uh, you know, on, on a daily basis. So that's one thing we're trying to get across is this definitely impacts an acquisition program because early in the program, when you're getting to milestone A, you have your initial product support strategy that's in your lifecycle sustainment plan. You submit that, my, milestone A, but in tech maturation risk reduction by the PDR, you're submitting your product support strategy and LCSP for approval at, at the PDR. And that's before it becomes a program of record at milestone B, but that's potentially years before you actually get to the operation and sustainment costs uh, for these AI-enabled systems. So part of the research was, hey, what can we tell program offices to start planning for uh, when these requirements come to their their systems uh, to actually add capability or create a new one from the ground up, what does that planning look like? Because part of that product support strategy, they're going to do a product support, uh, product support business case analysis. You know, we're going to do maintenance with uh, a, a mix of contractor or uh, by the soldiers, organic, or is it going to be purely organic or by the contractor? So they'll go through that business case analysis, get the best value uh, for the product support strategy. And so really, since these are different than your traditional hardware and software systems, and they require more frequency daily than your typical uh, hardware and software systems, you know, it's kind of, it needs to be treated as a product within a product because there's going to be a lot more involvement with that AI-enabled system and the ML model than typically you know, people don't really realize. And so that's what we're trying to get across. And so for program offices to start their planning because that happens early in the life cycle. And then one other thing to note, intellectual property and data, what we looked at is, okay, limited government 
purpose rights or unlimited rights. Those are the, the standard licensings for um, acquisition programs. You know, it varies by funding, right? So if the development of the item is purely private, uh, that's you know limited rights. And then if it's government purpose rights, if it's actually mixed funding, so private government investment, and then unlimited rights if it's fully funded for development from uh, the government. So th those are some things we're looking at for setting program offices up for success when they still have to put AI-enabled systems uh, out in the field. Now, to bring this all together here, the recommendation we want to put forward is this hybrid sustainment approach, where there's a combination of contractor and service support. So earlier, you may recall, I kind of mentioned, hey, there's these two ends of the spectrum of having everything done by contractors and having everything done internal, right? Well, not all maintenance tasks when it comes to an ML model are created equal. There are some that are difficult, that require years of experience, that require having a really good hands-on practitioner. So that's like developing how the retraining will happen. You know, like what are the right procedures? What are the right metrics? That you, you kind of have to know what you're doing for that. But other aspects of it, like the actual execution of it, that can be done by honestly a high school student with just the right technical manual that explains how to do it. So they're very trainable types of tasks. And luckily for us, right, these types of trainable tasks are those that occur the most frequently. So monitoring the model and then performing prescribed update steps is gonna be most of the interaction when it comes to the maintenance part of this. So from, I think, the Army paradigm, this would be your field level maintenance, right? So if you're using a rifle a lot, you have to zero your rifle from time to time. It's that kind of maintenance. Versus now these bigger types of things, which is like fully overhauling a model. Right? Like implementing a brand new one, doing the base training for a model to begin with, coming up with what is the right uh, set of metrics and retraining procedures for this particular model. That's where it's going to be more within the contractor support lane, but those types of maintenance activities are going to be far less frequent. And in fact, for some of those, they can be scheduled. Right? Now, with that, um, our kind of two little future work parts of this uh, is the data rights part, talking about well, how do we you know, sort the data across this type of hybrid system. The other one I think is probably most interesting that came out from this research for both of us was this idea of having an ML touch time analysis. So you know, if you go and you look right now, you can fire up Google and you say, how often do models need to be retrained? You are going to see an incredible variance in answers. And the best I have seen from the ML ops community where we're coalescing around is, well, it kind of depends on the data generation environment. If you have a very dynamic one, meaning things change a lot, and what's known as an adversarial one, so if you think something like fraud detection is a good example, where the data generated by fraudsters, although they're intentionally trying to hide that from being detected, so as you build something, they find a way to counter that, you're going to have to update daily or sometimes even more. For more stable ones, maybe something with like Budget estimates or things like that, it's whenever the budget estimate changes, so quarterly, maybe yearly. And so there is a very wide variance in that. And so what that means is when you have a program and you're going to use AI-enabled parts of this, you need to do that kind of analysis. You need to figure out what the domain looks like this is going to operate in. So you can say, all right, on any given week or quarter, how many man hours is it going to take to do these retraining tasks? And then that now gives you an assessment of cost, where you can now extend that over time and say, this is what the projected cost would look like, given how this model is going to work in reality. And I think our, our big final piece here we want to leave you with, though, is that for the two parts we began with, right? Sustainment planning starts early in a program. I learned that from Shane. Didn't know that before. It's given me some good education on the parts of this. But as part of that, you need to plan for the sustainment of your machine learning models in any AI system. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. So um, I like the way you ended that with, so you have to plan for sustainment of the model itself. Sometimes we forget that, you know, here's the model, it's their design to help you do the sustainment of whatever it is you're applying, but we forget about the model itself or the tools, and it's not just AI, it's all of our, our systems, so very well done, thank you. Um, we're gonna shift now to a slightly different, not AI, but contracting. Um, Next paper is uh, titled Commer um, Commercial and Defense Vendor Management, a Comparison of Competitive Procurement Below the Prime uh, Subcontract Level. So if you've ever been a program manager, you'll know how difficult that is. To, how do you, because as the PM, uh, PM doesn't really have a lot of 
control, the government PM does have a lot of control, direct control over the subcontracts, and uh, particularly the competitiveness of who they are and are, what quality is, or how do you do that? So competitive contracting at that level, it's, it's critically important to find, ensure that you have qualified, obviously, subcontractors, that they, uh, uh, you know, those negotiating terms that the primes are using are sort of of interest to us uh, in terms of who they're bringing on uh, and how they manage that, how the prime manages those subcontractors to ensure that they're in line with the, the overall program uh, objectives <clears throat> and that they bring the, um, uh, quality. So assessing that is a big is a big deal. So this next paper is um, by I guess I'll start with Dan. Dan uh, Finkenstadt, uh, is Lieutenant Colonel Dan Finkenstadt, one of our professors at Naval Postgraduate School for what another two days or something? Two uh, weeks. Two yeah, weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> How long have you been here? I've only seen you like two days. Are you, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> so you're Dan. No, I'm just kidding. Dan's been doing some fabulous work for. Uh, uh, for us at the Naval Postgraduate School, certainly you see some of the Air Force officers here and, uh, and uh, senior NCOs, uh, he's been doing a miraculous job of helping N NPS and the Department of Defense Management transform itself into a more tightly focused organization uh, that, uh, for innovation, contracting, he certainly brings a lot of value. We're, we're going to uh, miss having Dan around, uh, although he won't be far. Um, he's uh, published many, many articles in NCMA, CM, uh, Contract Management Magazine, Defense Acquisition Review Journal, the Journal for Purchasing and Supply Management, Internal, uh, International Journal for Operations and Production Management, and the Harvard Business Review. That ought to impress you. Um, Pete? Ginto. Ginto, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Pete uh, uh, is the president of government, defense, and aerospace at ResLine. Uh, Pete held positions as the chief of contracts, chief of career field management, a contracting officer, cost and price analyst, program manager, and procurement analyst across assignments at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Lots of great experience and the Pentagon and Randolph Air Force Base. Uh, he has a degree, a law degree from the University of Akron, and we, uh, uh, Appreciate you coming all the way out here to horrible Monterey and uh, <laughs> delivering this paper. So over to you. Thanks. Okay, and uh, we got Kyle Bronlick here too, as uh, oh, one of our co-authors. Yep, in the front row. Oh, great. <laughs> well, I, I've got your notes here. Where's Kyle? Raise your hand. There you are. So Kyle is a contract cost and buy. I'm glad you're here because we need to talk afterwards. I know I'm part of your bio here. Uh, I'll get to that. Kyle is a contract price. Uh, contract cost and price analyst and contracting officer for the Air Force at Wright-Patterson. But what struck me most interesting, what I want to talk to you is Kyle has an MBA from State, of, uh, from State University at uh, New York Polytechnic Institute. He also served as an adjunct professor, lecturing business courses to include financial management, which corporate finance, financial accounting, macroeconomics, human resource management at Mohawk Valley Community College, and I need some FM professors. So if you're interested in, <laughs> come see me. Okay. Oh, yeah. Great, thanks. To kind of tie this to the overall conversation, so uh, logistics is definitely a critical part of sustaining our force, but supply chain really is what delivers the indirect material, the direct material, and enables the services that are necessary to support both logistics and sustainment, but also the development and f ultimate fielding and modification of uh, goods and services to the warfighter. So this, uh, the uh, supply chain really is influenced really heavily by the way we buy things and the regulations that we have to follow to buy things. So that's what our, our paper primarily Wrong button. <laughs> so uh, kind of the overview, um, again, uh, really high level view. The, um, the Competition and Contracting Act was established in 1984, and it, it guides the way that we buy things, but also the way that our uh, prime contractors buy things, where you have a con uh, clause flow down that requires competition to the maximum extent possible anywhere within our supply base. And ironically, in that same year, uh, the Harvard Business Review published the first really widely distributed article about something called the Japanese way. So, so the Japanese way <clears throat> of manufacturing encompasses multiple things. Most of the time, um, folks focus on lean manufacturing, 
managing inventories uh, at a really lean level to make sure you're optimized in terms of cost. But it also includes things like human resource management, managing human resources a little bit differently, um, uh, making objective measures of how the workforce is performing. Um, and then finally, what we're talking about today is vendor relationship management. So the Japanese way kind of moves away from competition and it moves more towards strategic management of vendors, um, generally smaller pools of vendors that aren't competed every time. So when we're looking at Sika versus the Japanese way, which was kindly widely adopted by the commercial plate marketplace, we wanted to have a good idea of uh, what it looks like in our DOD supply base that's supposed to be complying with Sika versus the commercial supply base, which is largely shifted towards the Japanese way of managing vendors. Uh, so this DOD commercial uh, exploration is what we did. Uh, we'll talk about the data in a little bit. And then also, I think one of the big outcomes for us was that we really need more, um, more research here and also better data collection to really understand the uh, dynamics of the sourcing marketplace. So a little bit on defense uh, competition. This was uh, something uh, published by uh, Acquisition and Sustainment back in 2022. You can see over time, the uh, degree of competition in the defense marketplace has gone down dramatically. Um, market consolidation is certainly a factor uh, that's most probably was most widely talked about when it comes to the lack of competition. Um, another challenge that for us while we were doing this paper and, and really for the DOD as a whole, and I think it, in the intro you kind of mentioned this, sub-tier visibility is very low. Right, so we get um, bills of material in a, in a proposal phase where we see who vendors um, are proposed to be before execution of an effort, but then that bill of material can change dramatically over time in execution. Unless we have a post-performance bill of material, which we very rarely get, we don't know who the contractor really went to at the end of the day. So um, below our tier one vendors, we really only see who's there if a tier one vendor is large enough that a TINA proposal comes along with it. And then you actually see, again, who is at least proposed for the effort. But as you go down tier to tier, the, uh, the size of the contracts diminish, and generally you get very little visibility. Um, also, FSRS, it's the reporting tool for subcontracts, really only applies to tier ones over $30,000. Um, and in addition to that, reporting has been very poor over time. Uh, just looking at a small sample set of data, we saw that uh, um, even, even a small group of contracts wasn't reported accurately. Uh, and then the last piece, inflation is really high, right? It's the significant impacts there in the marketplace have been generally on uh, lower tier vendors who have firm fixed price long-term agreements in place, which kind of has further stressed the, uh, the uh, supply base as a whole and uh, encouraged further consolidation. I talk a little bit more about the Japanese way. Uh, is competition really the best thing to do? Um, the, the Japanese way um, kind of gives a uh, counterpoint to competing everything. So some of the key features of the supplier relationship management uh, aspect of the Japanese way is uh, something called Kiretsu. It's uh, managing, some, the Japanese call it Kiretsu, it's really strategic relationship management with a smaller pool of vendors that are gone back to time over time. And Kiretsu ties back to an idea of family, right? treating the vendors as though they're family, really closely engaging with them. Um, and partnering with those suppliers really closely to work with them and share best practices to try to improve quality performance and schedule with a long-term focus in mind. Uh, another really important aspect um, that we had a very hard time assessing in the defense marketplace was the use of indirect competition using single sourcing as a strategy. So in the DOD, we talk frequently about uh, competitive versus non-competitive. Most of the bills of material we had to review, we really only knew if it was competitive or non-competitive. But in the commercial space, there's, there's more, um, more complexity. So single sourcing is uh, a business's decision when they could have sourced from multiple vendors, multiple vendors could have provided the good or service. They decided to select one single source instead to try to take advantage of a greater, um, greater scale of production uh, and also to really closely partner with the vendor. So sole sourcing, what we generally see in the, in the DOD as uh, non-competitive efforts, is when there's only one vendor that can provide a good or service, and that could stem from um, an initial phase where there's only one vendor, or an initial winner-take-all competition 
where we decide on one sole source, and then that's the only source we can rely on uh, moving forward. And then the last uh, sourcing strategy we, um, we assessed was multi-sourcing. So multi-sourcing is uh, taking that last scenario where you compete initially, and instead of doing winner take all, you award some market share to one competitor and some market share to another competitor, generally rewarding the most competitive offer with more market share. So uh, that multi-sourcing tool is used a lot in the commercial place with uh, items that are hypercritical to the delivery of uh, revenue to the shareholder. So we want to make sure you don't have a single choke point in your supply chain for those really critical items. So here's the data that we used. Um, we used 11 uh, defense program efforts, uh, kind of limited primarily to the aerospace vertical. Uh, reviewed over uh, 1.3 million parts. You can see the, the data there. Uh, pretty significant value to those parts. Um, and on the commercial side, we used uh, commercial supply chain data uh, that's uh, collected by my company for our um, primarily commercial clients, although there are, there are some defense primes uh, in, in, the, in the pool. Um, and really looked across multiple industry verticals, um, not, not limited aerospace, kind of looked at all over the place. Uh, looked at over 2.3 million parts, and uh, the time frame is real time, so real current data used by the, the clients. Uh, and again, uh, highlight quickly that the bill of materials that we used on the defense side was the bill of materials that came with the proposal. In each of these instances, there was no post-performance bill of materials, so it's the best data we could have used. And then on the commercial side, uh, we broke things out in those three categories I previously des uh, described. But on the uh, non-commercial side, on the DOD side, we could really only delineate between competitive and non-competitive. So uh, here's the data, and I think this next slide gives a little better visual representation. You can see on the commercial side, single source parts really dominated the, the, uh, uh, the data. So 98% of the parts were single sourced where the commercial companies had more than one source to use, but they decided to use one. Right, so that, um, that really, to me, reflects big adoption of uh, strategic management of vendors, working close partnership with vendors, um, vice the you know, one-time competition. Um, you see multi-sourcing uh, is a little over 1%. Um, so there is a you know, significant instance of uh, competitive sourcing while maintaining more than one source. And if you look at the defense data, um, except for one outlier, the vast majority of the supply relationships uh, were, were non-competitive. So where, um, where we would anticipate a greater rate of competition because SICA is in place, there's actually far less. Here's some other general findings. Um, this, this is supported both, both by the data and by a lot of other research uh, articles that, that looked at adoption of the, the Japanese way. The rate of competition in the commercial marketplace has gone down, and the rate of adoption of the Japanese way of vendor management engaging with vendors for long-term strategic relationships has really gone up. Uh, DOD sub-tier visibility is, is really challenging right now. Um, the public sources of data as well as the bills of material that we uh, use to uh, analyze that data lack the detail that we need to really assess how well our vendor, our uh, prime contractors are strategically managing their base. Uh, and, and again, um, last, last comment's the same. We really need to do a better job of, uh, of coding the data and requesting in a standardized format how things are sourced, both by the prime contractors and ideally at sub-tier levels too. Um, again, I talked about some of the limitations of our data. Um, but one thing that I think would be really beneficial to do in further research is to explore single versus sole sourcing in the DOD to see how that compares to the commercial marketplace and then uh, explore causality, right? Look into the um, DOD and commercial subcontact competition rates. And I think that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so our last paper is... Um, Sort of put, rounds it out, I think, in it very, very nicely. And at the end, we'll we'll do we'll save all the questions, obviously, to the end in the discussion. Um, this last paper is optimizing operations and logistics support using Oppos Evo. Um, 
So optimizing operations and logistics support, that's the challenge, right? How to get the stuff where it's needed at the right time in the right quantity, but you don't want to overdo that either. So uh, some of the things, challenges with doing that, you know, uh, ensuring good visibility in the supply chain, where's the stuff? You know, how do I know it's arriving? How would you like to be in a foxhole and you got blankets when you need bullets? Um, uh, managing inventory levels. One of our big challenges in the DOD, you know, folks, we're, we're an inherently wasteful organization when we go to combat. You know, do we choose the Iron Mountain or do we try and do just in time? You know, FedEx, I need uh, ammunition in my foxhole. Could you, like, deliver that for me? Well, not so much, unless you pay me a whole bunch of money. Um, so maybe we have to be inherently, you know, uh, 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 wasteful in some areas. Optimize transportation costs. You know, what, uh, we clearly have some challenges when it comes to transportation in a contested environment. It's, again, logistics pipelines, improving customer service, that sort of goes without saying. And of course, how much risk are we willing to take in these environments, depending on uh, where that uh, uh, capability is um, going. So the, the final paper, um, is, um, again, uh, I'll just introduce the, the speaker. Uh, John Verbanek is a senior analyst with three years experience at uh, um, Cis Systicon, yep. Sorry. Uh, North America. He's serving 15, he served 15 years as a weapons systems officer in the U.S. Air Force. After leaving the military, John went to work as a manufacturing engineer supervisor with Honeywell Aerospace, working on manufacturing process control supply chain improvements and process improvements based off Six Sigma analysis. His bachelor's degree in history from the United States Air Force Academy and a master of military operational arts and sciences uh, from the Air Command and Staff College. Um, I don't think your uh, co-author is here, but I'll let you uh, say a few words on about him. Appreciate it, sir. Sure. Uh, my co-author of the study is uh, Dr. Gustav Solving. Um, he's our one of our principal anal analysts, as well as our senior software developer for the Open Suite software. Um, he has a uh, doctorate from uh, Georgetown Institute of Technology in industrial engineering, as well as a master's in operational research. So, moving on. Uh, this is what I'm gonna cover today. Um, the big thing in this presentation is we're utilizing technology in the, with the Opus Evo application for our software um, capabilities. Um, ultimately, what we were asked for, a headquarters ACC um, came to us um, as we are um, the JPOS uh, modelers for the Joint Strike Fighter um, and asked us, you know, given this situation, can you improve, one, our availability, mission completion capability while lowering our um, logistics footprint? Um, so, OPSEO software allows us, or we want to try it out, use it, and show that, yeah. Um, we think we can do better. So model-based capabilities, um, we do predictive analytics for life cycle sustainment, um, not just for aircraft. I'm going to focus on aircraft, but we do model um, ships as well as uh, all ground vehicles. Um, so we mo model and simulate impacts of decisions. Ultimately, my job is to what if different scenarios. So create a baseline model, and then people ask me, you know, how can I save money? How can I save resources? How can I do this? And traditionally, you can sit down and try to work it out with the models. We're a lot to, able to do it a lot quicker and a lot more efficiently, um, all dependent on if we have um, good, accurate data. Um, so analysis alternatives and influencing the current state. So our, the decisions that are presented to us, um, at least in this project, really look at, again, how can we be more lean? How can we be more combat capable um, the, given the developing situations? So um, some of my colleagues have also worked um, on different Air Force projects looking at the ACE model for the Pacific deployments and things like that with different air weapon systems. So we're using this kind of to show what we can do and how we can do it better. Opus Suite in general, is a software package that we've developed um, comprising three main softwares and um, some applications. 
Opus 10 allows us to do spares optimization. Simlocks, which is what I do and which is what we're going to talk about with Opus Evo, um, allows us to determine mission performance over a given time. Uh, Catlock gives lifecycle analysis and again, Opus Evo allows us to optimize using simulation outputs. So ultimately we look for a domain model. Um, with that we take data and we look, use a holistic approach. So what's the support solution? Where are the workshops? Where's the depots? What capability with maintenance do you have and where's it located? Um, we look at the technical system. So what are, for most systems, what is determined uh, maintenance significant items and how they're gonna affect operational status going forward. And then we look at the operational concept. What does the combatant commander want in terms of capability at any given time? And then we analyze all that data to create an optimized spares model as well as an optimized maintenance strategy and in some cases um, recommendations on how to better employ your assets. Um, so ultimately we can do this throughout the life cycle. Um, like I said, my, my primary program is on the Joint Strike Fighter. I continually give a 10-year outlook of what mission capability rates will be, NMCS rates, NMCM rates, out to 10 years based off the data that's um, provided to us. Um, so what Opus Evo is, is a heuristic um, optimization algorithm. And again, I'm gonna refer to my notes really on this because Dr. Solving is more of the technical expert at this than I am. Um, but in essence, what we're doing is taking our baseline model and now we're expanding it to look at other applications. Generally, we, our model systems and what people look at is a cost versus availability analysis, growth curve, things like that. What EVO allows us to do is if we have any kind of numeric countable um, data application, we can now optimize to that. Um, so, in this sense, um, we're talking about how to improve MC rates while reducing our logistics footprint. Um, so, as long as I have that data, I can now take my baseline model, and it may not be the optimal based off cost, okay? Um, just how modeling works, it's not going to happen. But it'll, EVO allows us to look at all the subsystem or subparts underneath that optimized curve and say, okay, What's going to give me the best bang for my buck based off of your individual requirement, be it cost, be it um, dimensional data, uh, logistics footprint? And how we do that is um, utilizing um, evolutionary algorithms. So we take our baseline model and create gen uh, random samples. You can see on the that right of the screen. Um, and we evaluate and select the best fits. We call those our parents. And this is where we utilize um, machine learning and AI um, to help find those best fits, cycle that back through the model, you know, keep doing it until we find and get to a point where we get an optimal solution. And to do it numerous times, if a single person was to do it individually, as an example, the Joint Strike Fighter performance model, it takes 10 hours just to run one iteration or one look at it. With this, I can get my baseline model results and say, here's the third parameter I want to look at, and it'll go in, and instead of trying to do it, you know, haphazardly, you know, random guess what works best, the e, um, AI ML will take the numbers, and in a, what would take maybe a month if I do it just by random chance, reduce that timeline down to what we told the Air Force we could have an answer within about five days um, for what they're looking for. Um, again, uh, we utilize a differential evolution algorithm and um, implementation of DE um, through our model. Um, our opus domain, our baseline model is what's given. Some of the pluses and minus um, for the fitness function, um, again, it's very good at approximation and for most functions that's what you're looking for and we can evaluate just about anything as long as it's quantifiable. The minus is, you know, 
it may be a little slower um, in some senses, but for the most part, it's quicker than doing it by hand. And that kind of shows it. So the scenario we were given um, by the Air Force was we want to look at a deployment of a fighter squadron. Um, they gave us a list of 18, 24 tail numbers. Um, so I had to look up what configurations those were um, for the F-35. Um, if you're not aware, there, we currently model about 80 F-35 configurations that are flying today. Um, so figure out what parts packages they incorporate, as well as what their ops tempo that they're going to look at and materialize is. So the F-35 program has what they call a ship um, spares packages and deployed spares packages. These are generalized, you know, they work great, but it's very highly scripted on what they can and can't do. The scenario that we were given was same number of aircraft as a DSP would take. However, they reduced the number of flying hours by 50%. Um, but increase the sortie rate um, a little bit. So trying to reduce footprint, try to tell you, I'm going to take less than what that deployment service package is going to give you. Um, so with that, we took their plan scenario, which is five two-ship lines a day, uh, find a 2.5 average sortie duration over a 20-day period. They want to maintain that two-ship capability throughout the 20 days and figure out, you know, for the F-35, it takes one C-17 to deploy one aircraft, so a squadron 24, you need 24 C-17s. Low unreasonable, especially if we're looking at the ACE model concept, um, distributive um, deployments throughout the Pacific, it's not going to work. So what we did is we looked at their solution, which um, they gave us their pack out list, and we looked at our solution utilizing EVO. The top um, chart there is the EVO answer. And you can see on it, you know, shows unavailable, ready, mission assigned, and on mission fully capable. Our solution reduced the parts by 30% um, taken. I did not have dimensional data at the time or how um, it's palletized, so I couldn't make that comparison, but just by a part number comparison, I could show them that we did reduce our footprint. The other side effect of that was, is based off their flight profiles, I was able to maintain an eight aircraft mission available or aircraft available throughout the entire 20 days of this deployment, whereas they dropped to two, mission, two aircraft available by day 15. So my solution provided a capability of meeting the commander's intent, as well as giving them a surge capability that they did not plan for, um, for the deployment. So really the next steps with this are um, tailor the results, um, figure out how to utilize this more. Again, we're working with the Air Force more with the ACE um, concept, um, working with the Marines a little bit on this as well and figuring out you know, how best we can optimize outside of cost versus availability. How can we you know, look at things like dimensionals, reducing your footprint, maybe reducing your manpower um, requirements as well. Um, anything that is quantifiable, we can optimize. Um, so in summary, it's a method of val evaluating systems available and missions readiness, extends the um, capabilities through optimization. On there it says if it can be modeled, it can be evaluated. If it can be evaluated, it can be optimized. Um, I also like to think of EVO as taking normally the strategic answer, which um, the decision makers at the JPO really look for, and taking it down to a tactical level, which the combat commander um, wants or desires and needs. And I think that's it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, at this point, we've got a few minutes left for questions. So what we'll do is we'll uh, uh, just raise your hand. There's a microphone there. I think that works. And I've got one question online, but we'll start with the audience there if anybody would like to kick us off. 
Actually, while you're going over there, Corey, I'll ask a question, give you time to, uh, to walk over there. So my first question is on the, uh, it's sort of along the lines of the question online, which I'll read and then I'll add to, is there anything planned for usage of AI uh, to logistics, especially uh, when it comes to moral compass and regulation? And I like to sort of tw change that, not change, but add to that or a little more in depth, but you know, one of the challenges with AI that you hear is like, what about the ethical solution? How do you know it's telling you what you, what you think it's telling you? And how do you know it's making ethical decisions? So when you look at it from the context of applying this to a sustainment world, is, do you see any uh, challenges there with the maintenance of AI or the development of AI or, or the implementation of AI? So this is a good question. Um, the short answer is to that is it's complicated. So, you know, you, there, there's a lot of, there absolutely are ethical considerations when it comes to maintaining some of these things. So I, I looked at one this morning that was directly in this, right? So the building of the data set that goes into kind of the baselining for GPT class of models that was built on the backs of people being paid $15 an hour to label data. That has some ethical considerations with how they were being paid as part of doing that. So there's no part about it that doesn't have those parts of it, but the complicated part is, is it's not a priori clear if given a certain scenario and model that, aha, this is the ethical way to do this. A lot of that honestly just comes from having done the work a lot and being intimately familiar with the domain. So this, there's a lot of expertise that goes into that and it's, there's, there is no kind of silver bullet test that says, well, this was ethically done or not, as I'd say for that. Yeah, just to uh, uh, add to it and perhaps it'll stir some thinking. So yeah, if you were here yesterday, uh, you're one of the speakers talk about uh, active protection systems uh, for armored vehicles. And one of the challenges the, uh, as the Army went through that for many years were that slowed us down just a bit were the ethical choices that an active protection system would make given the threat. So how does it decide whether to, to, to to launch or not launch. And for those of you unfamiliar with active protection, it's sort of like the missile on a missile mounted to the side of a tank, right? So if you run up a bunch of kids next to a tank and then you shoot at it, what do you do? So as this is a clearly, and you've heard this in the news, right? You've heard uh, some leading uh, thinkers say, you know, maybe we ought to put the brakes on AI because we're not sure what it's going to do as we start to embed these systems into our DNA, like logistics. At the top level, we sort of put, can put our brain around what AI is doing, but when you start to see it in subsystems and logistics support systems, slowly start to creep into all of these environments. And so as we think through that ethical and the controlling of those systems, I think that's an important area of research there. Go ahead. I, yeah, so just to add like on the designing the parameters of the models or the things that you're doing, considering like what's the function of it. So if we design too many things around defense needs, but n don't consider the other things the defense department gets asked to do, we'll miss one of the key areas which we saw with COVID, which was equity of distribution, right? So when you're thinking about distributing certain goods, um, you know, meeting the sole needs of the defense department when we, if we had modeled that, right, from a pure logistics, just raw, you know, do it gets the most to the warfighter or to the US or whoever, um, and no one had considered the equity and like how we distribute that to certain groups and what the long-term impacts are, it actually will come back to bite you, right? So we, especially in a healthcare scenario, in a healthcare scenario, you know, it's a, you make decisions today for your immediate needs that cost you way down the line um, because you're not looking at those other things. And we saw that with all the models that people were trying to run to give out vaccines or PPE and stuff like that. And so if you don't design for that, I think that's a risk as well, right? It's not really just the AI not making ethical decisions. It's just that the humans that built it never thought about that, right? So you have to think about the ethics of how you're building the model. Just kind of add more on the acquisition side. So I had some experience uh, working for the government where we were in an emergency acquisition situation and we had to vet vendors really rapidly to make sure we were gonna award contracts to the right folks. So we had some AI vendor vetting tools available to us at the time. Um, and really we only acted this way because it was an emergency situation. Those AI tools deciding whether or not this is a vendor we can award to creates some ethical problems where a human in the loop really is necessary. Um, and one other piece where I think 
kind of ethics and, and equity on the AI side, tying back to like the data rights discussion. So generally in the acquisition community, when we're looking at data rights, we're looking at computer and software documentation, not really um, validation and verification data or training data, which is really a critical element of the, the AI system. So ethically, I'm not sure what the right answer is there, right? Should we apply those standard, you know, restricted, limited GPR, unlimited rights to that data? Or should that data be treated, you know, a completely different way? Okay, Corey. Uh, Corey Yoder, David Postgraduate School. Uh, this is for Dan and Peter. Um, when, when you guys were talking, it, it, I got very intrigued by the fact of these the single source type acquisitions that, that industry is using. Um, and you, you mentioned the Competition and Contracting Act, uh, but I was also thinking about the dimensions of the PPP, limitations on appropriations, and OSDs kind of putting the brakes on long, long range, greater than five year contract types. Do you see that those longer range relationships maybe need to be holistically relooked at, and maybe those considerations incorporated into decision logic that, that, that maybe we can get some of those piloted? I know the Air Force is using it, it uh, on aircraft maintenance, uh, but, but you just don't see a lot of those long-range contracts where those types of relationships can develop. Yes, I, I definitely think more long-term contracts are, are necessary. And I think Dr. LaPlante talked about it the other day. We have more congressional approval for long-term contracts than we ever had before. They're not sure where they're going to do it or not because, again, we're um, not only is there, are there fewer or less long-range contracts, it's more about fielding new stuff rapidly and then not sustaining it for as long. So one, one of the, the things that uh, the automotive industry does, and there's actually a direct example um, that Toyota did that was written about in one of the HBR things that's cited in our paper, um, and, and they do this not just with this component, but for lots of components. So they field multiple um, types of vehicles, and they'll have a couple vendors that they'll decide to single source to for one vehicle. Right, so they're going to make a Corolla, and they're going to use one vendor for all Corolla steering wheels. They're single sourced. But then on the Camry, they'll decide, you know, we're going to, we're going to use a different single source on the Camry a steering wheel. Now, those two sources know that next year there are more models coming out, and they'll do the next generation of each vehicle. So they're in incentivized by indirect competition to do better on cost, schedule, and performance. So now, by using those, um, those two single sourcing decisions, you have a short-term impact, but also a long-term impact, encouraging them to you know, do the CapEx stuff to be better. So I think that, um, that could easily be applied in the Department of Defense, but the challenge is the DOD needs to get more involved with the strategic sourcing decisions that are made by the industrial base, because the industrial base isn't just one you know, operating unit making all these things on their own. They're disparate, different contractors that don't see the full picture that the DOD does. I had a second question related to that. How, uh, you know, getting the business cases up through the HCA chain of command for approval for these long-range contract types is, is very difficult. And so we're probably missing a lot of opportunities to, to explore these on a, on a more macro scale. And when you look at the industry stats that you guys had, it, it seems to be an industry norm in, in some, some businesses. Yeah, I think the biggest thing with our data is we just don't have the insight at all. So to keep in mind, like, you know, it's really tough when you talk about SECA and stuff, not to just devolve back to the prime, thinking about your relationship with the prime, but we're, we're talking about what's happening below that prime level. And most of those prime contractors were either sole source contractors or really limited competition, right? And so you're hoping that there's any SECA level, it's going to get pressed down there. Keeping in mind that most of those primes, I think it's like eight primes make up 46 percent of our entire expenditure yeah. right so think about that like what, what is seeker really doing right the other thing is on the subcontract data when you look at like usaspending.gov for subcontract data it's absolutely insane like i think 20 we have a picture of it up there in the backups but 2020 had a million trillion dollars is what we spent in subcontracts that's what they're reporting a million trillion dollars which I'm fairly certain has never been spent in the entirety of the world. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, so that's the kind of data problems that we have at that yeah. level, right? Um, and if you read the GAO reports, FSRS has not been successful at all. It's been very poor. Um, yeah. So we need that more. We are doing the strategic sourcing thing, though, if you look at, like, category management stuff that we've done in the Air Force, but it's also really under-resourced, and it's losing traction. So um, it's not going in the right direction. We need more category management. Where we did do a successful thing, like what Pete's talking about with steering wheels, 
is we assessed milling machines across our ALCs. And the milling machines for these were just like all over the place, right? So there's like 15 different versions. Everybody doesn't know how to use them all. And each one, it was a mess. So they're like, hey, you need to standardize. And then we asked the team, like, okay, you're standardizing to a certain type of, you know, uh, five, four and five axis milling machine. But are you doing that in all your ALCs? Because now you're going to one model. What happens when there's a part or something? Yeah, now you've lost resiliency, right? And they said, oh, well, the way we solved that was at each ALC, we picked different models. They said, you'll standardize at this ALC to this model. You'll standardize at this ALC to this model. You'll standardize at this ALC to this model. So we have diversity across the enterprise, but we have specialty within the location. And so that was a nice blended enterprise solution that you get at with category management and enterprise view of things that you're talking about, Corey. But we just don't have it, man. I mean, our category yeah. managers, we have like two or three that actually manage their categories. We have some categories that have no manager. So, I mean, yeah. it's, it's a lot of talk, not a lot of doing. And GSA's version of category management is the more you use our contracts, the more you've done category management. That is not category management. Most category management is about demand planning and requirements development. It has nothing to do with acquisition on the, on the buying side, right? It's, right? If you look at what most of our enterprise solutions have been, 13% of the problem solved or solutions that we came up with were contract related. The rest of them were non-contract related solutions that had to do with better defined requirements, changing how we do policy, and all these things. So it's a bigger problem, and so it gets at what you're talking about. Yeah, there's some, some other elements to the, the concept of like multi-year contracts too. So there's a lot we can do that's within our span of control. Right? So we're, when I think you're referring mostly to like a multi-year contract. Yeah. Right? So those multi-year contracts are the best value for us. Primarily because the defense industrial base doesn't invest in any inventory on their own unless there's a concrete demand signal. So next year's material is not going to be bought unless I know I got a multi-year contract. Yeah. So that's the best case scenario in terms of creating efficiency. But there's there's middle ground too, right? So um, multi-sourcing, we great example of that. Kind of to add on the milling story, the the F100 and the F110 engine. Their, their uh, multi-sourcing was written about in a book called The Great, uh, the Great Engine War. It's like the best acquisition book I've ever read. Um, but we can do that on a lower scale too, right? At a programmatic level, we can decide, you know, this EOIR sensor, we're not gonna buy them all from Raytheon. We'll buy from Raytheon and L3. And we'll maintain that over a long period of time. And then you create that multi-sourcing at a really tactical low level without the required approval, you know, going up to Congress. Yeah. And the other one, um, I don't think we use quite enough either is uh, MAC IDIQ contracts oh, okay. or priced IDIQ yeah. contracts with pricing tables where we can negotiate a long-term deal with the contract, uh, sorry, with the vendor, and we commit to um, a min buy in each year to assure pricing validi validity in the out years, right? If you don't have a min buy in a given year and you have a production line break, you have loss of learning, and then it's a big problem for the contractors. So having those vehicles in place really does two things, right? It, it optimizes cost a little better because the contractor goes out and gets long-term price contracts with the vendors and gives a demand signal to the vendors that, hey, don't stop making this thing. Don't go end of life. There's something coming. And then internally, it creates a pressure. There is a min-buy requirement here. Not only um, do we need to meet that min-buy requirement, we need to push to have that min-buy requirement ordered by the time this contract expires or we lose our vehicle which the program offices you know, really, really hate and can message up to Congress, to the PSMs, that this is important funding that we need to get it right now. So I think all, a lot of the tools um, are just underutilized in the yeah. DOD, uh, but yeah, there's, there's probably other ways too I'm not thinking of, I'm sure. So, thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, Nicole Hall, student with the Department of Defense Management. I have a question in terms of AI. Um, given the complexity of AI, what's the rationale for using cost as the principal factor in understanding the sustainment? So initially, when you're doing your acquisition strategy and your product support strategy, cost is a determining factor. You have to do your analysis on cost. Uh, you do that business case analysis, like I briefly mentioned, for you know your organic, your contractor, or mix of either either one. Um, it, and really, the big deal is at milestone B. Once it comes official program record, your ab acquisition program baseline is established, and then from there, um, depending if you do your cost analysis correctly, you know you could potentially breach if you haven't done it correctly early in the life cycle. Um, so that's where it's 
you know, when we talk about, hey, this is important to analyze it, because if you spread that over all the DOD systems, uh, AI gets incorporated, and we don't understand what's required to sustain it, then costs could potentially be, you know, a big issue. You could have a, a, an overrun that you weren't, you weren't really planning for, you know? Um, so that's why we kind of, you know, looked at it from a cost perspective as part of our research. Yeah, no. I'll add a little bit to that. that I've never seen an AI or a, an ML program or things that I've been associated with ever die because the model didn't perform well. They all died because they got too expensive. And they got too expensive because as they were running that model, they kept having to redo it and retrain it and redo it and redo it and redo it, and the contractor charged them every time for that, and that burned the program like that. And a lot of those steps, frankly, could have been done internally. Those could have been trainable skills, but we never contracted the right way for that. Kate Forster, our Department of Defense Management. With the Army's exploration of using machine learning and AI, has your research found any way of safeguarding or preventing or identifying bad data input at the field level? So, so within my academic work, yes, there's, there's a lot on that, right? So that's actually one of the ones we, I think this is with CCDC, we do this research on data poisoning and looking at that. And that's, I mean, that's a huge, hugely important problem that's sort of lost on this, right? Like if you start with that, it's garbage in, garbage out, right? If you start with bad data, you're going to get bad models regardless. But it becomes even more malicious than that, where if you're doing things like scraping huge troves of data from the internet, a malicious actor can inject like bad data into it. And there's even attacks where they can backdoor a model doing that type of thing, because the model as it learns, its weights are a reflection of the data that it learned. And so if you do that with some clever math, you can even create vulnerabilities deliberately within it. And so that's, that is another like element that has to be considered when we like do things for contracting, right? If we contract for a large language model and we leave the contractor to train all of this, it also has to come with some standards about data quality and ensuring that it was good, lest we buy something that's already basically has a vulnerability injected into it and then put it on our networks. It's a great observation. So we only have a minute or so left, so I just want to wrap it up with this final question or thought. If you, 30 seconds. And so go John, Ian, and Shane, actually, or, or any of you could do that. So uh, from a AI or for this predictive analytics, how do you, what are your thoughts on VV and A? So like, so the tools that you heard throughout yesterday and today a bit, you know, verification, validation of the of the models of the software, uh, predictive analytics sort of implies you're going to have some AI in there at some point, if not already. Uh, what are your thoughts on um, validation when AI is learning, and teaching itself, and changing? So, I'm going to give kind of a cryptic response because. What I'm going to say is the paradigm that we've had, and I'll refer to it more as T&E because that's how we usually do it in the ML community, but the paradigm that we've had with the T&E aspects of it is an old paradigm. That T&E is actually going to become part of the evolutionary process of the model working in practice. And that sounds a little bit weird, but as we have these large foundational models moving to edge models, what you're going to see is that actually becomes an in situ process of the service member using the model. And so it's just a different paradigm. I think, I think we're going to evolve the paradigm for how we look at what T&E of an ML model is in the near future. That's my. So I think you're, we're, what I heard you say is you're going to accelerate DevOps very quickly as things. I just got a two minute warning. Okay, um, so at least on my side for VVNA, um, it's extremely important just because of the output that we're giving really affects multi-billion dollar you know, purchases um, every year. So um, for our example, um, the Navy uh, VV and aid our Opus suite two years ago, um, and it's been VVA'd by the British Ministry of Defense, et cetera. So the addition of the AI ML um, into Evo, um, allowing us to quickly identify things, it's important. Um, the question really is, you know, unlike some other AI model solutions, for our solution, it's really looking at, you know, result, best answer. So it's a little easier to get around um, that concept there. Yeah, the only thing I would say is um, just I, I don't do 
the verification stuff, but I do know that if you ask folks about how you go about validating models and what the application is for the AI, if it requires a ton of human effort to validate, then maybe you don't need to be using AI for that function. Uh, maybe you need to use a human for that and then find other functions on top of that to layer in the AI. But I just would warn against that in this world of like AI solves all things. Um, if the only way to validate it is by boots on ground, then maybe AI is not the right solution for you. Yeah, that's what I kind of was going to offer too. So the application of AI in the supply chain side that I've seen sold a lot is the capability to AI map a supply chain so I could tell you who your tier ones are and your twos and threes and fours. And really the only way to validate that data is to ask your tier ones who you use for tier one and then who do you use for tier two, use PO data to validate that they actually use them. So if that's never happened in the first place, the models end up being incredibly unreliable in, in, in execution. But to, to check that they're accurate, you have to do all that hard work anyway. It's a very difficult cycle. Okay, I think we're about out of time. I want to thank our panelists for the great papers and discussion and thank the audience for your good questions and, and, and engagement. Enjoy the rest of the uh, symposium.